All right. The bickering and the turmoil within the National Party continues after last week's failed attempts to remove Michael McCormack as leader. Speculation over whether McCormack will remain party leader, it continues. And tensions are high between so-called moderate Liberals, I'll call them Turnbull-type Liberals, I don't like the word moderate, who do not agree with Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan's support for coal, either used here or as an export. Our Sky News political editor Andrew Clennell joins me now live from Parliament House. Well, it's all very interesting, isn't it? Because the bad blood, as always is the case with these things, whether it's a reshuffle or, in this case, a leadership spill, it continues long beyond the initial day. Yes, it does, Peter. I think the, the difference here is often uh, the tactic is for the uh, vanquished to slink away and uh, return in a few months with another salvo. Uh, Barnaby Joyce and the other Rebel Nats show no sign of this. I mean, in the lead up to the spill, they adopted a, a course of action which is known as chaos theory. You had kind of an announcement every hour in terms of Joyce saying he's running, Canavan then saying he's resigning from Cabinet, uh, it being briefed out they had the numbers. They built up ahead of steam some momentum. You would have thought after the vote the spill vote, that that would uh, cease for quite a while. But there's no sign of that happening. We had, of course, this vote uh, on the Deputy Speaker, which went the way of a, a Joyce Nat, for, for lack of a better term, rather than a McCormack Nat, in Lou O'Brien defeating Damien Drum with Labor's help. And we've also had uh, numerous public comments and party room comments by Matt Canavan about coal and coal-fired power stations. We've had Barnaby Joyce out there suggesting he and others could cross the floor. So the campaign continues against Michael McCormack, it seems to me. And it, look, it's interesting. I have to put that down to the fact that those numbers must have been a lot closer uh, than McCormack's crowd were briefing out because if there was real distance in the numbers between McCormack and Joyce, they would slink away, they would regroup and they'd come back and, and have another go, as I think they will, because Barnaby's on a mission to be leader again if he can get there. Um, but they would, they'd have to go and do some work on colleagues. Clearly to me, mate, it's very, very tight, and they think a continued pressure is going to force the split. Now, there will be a point when the hard heads inside both of the major parties, the National Party and the Liberal Party, say if McCormack can't heal and move on. If you can't unite and move on, then there has to be a plan B. There has to be an alternative candidate. We know uh, David Littleproud's been talked about there. Um, how do you think this is, this is going down with the Prime Minister in particular? Because he's wearing a lot of the opprobrium and it's certainly sucking out air from his broader messages. Well, I don't think he's happy with Michael McCormack and his inability to unite them and the fact that all the jobs went to McCormack supporters. None, not even Deputy Speaker, was allocated to a Joyce supporter. So the feeling within the Yeah, let me just uh, jump Liberal in there. Sorry, and... sorry, Andrew. Let me just jump in there. But if the PM has allowed that to happen or his office has allowed that to happen, then more fool him because he knows the recommendations coming forward from McCormack go to him as recommendations into the Governor-General for Cabinet. He makes the call. Now, I don't know why he didn't stand up to McCormack and say, fine, you don't want Joyce, I can live with that. Everybody else is your pick, mate. I want you to put back in Canada. Why didn't the Prime Minister express some sort of uh, authority on these picks? Well, I reported on Sunday, Peter, a text exchange between Barnaby Joyce and the Prime Minister where Barnaby Joyce made that kind of point to the PM and the Prime Minister's, uh, from the, what I've heard, texted back words to the effect of it's, uh, it's not my business, it's National Party business. So it's like he's washed his hands of it. Um, yes, he could have at the very least attempted to talk McCormack into a different course of action, but I think the problem for McCormack was in order to get the numbers, and I agree with you, they were close, but I believe they were close two hours before the ballot and when it became clear McCormack was going to win, they shifted. But to get those mm -hmm. numbers, he had to promise mm -hmm. a whole bunch of people jobs. So in that instance, uh, I think McCormack would argue to Morrison, well, there's nothing I can do, my hands are tied. In order to win the leadership, I had to promise all these jobs, including Deputy Speaker, to Damien Drum. And therefore, you end up with the mess we ended up with, really.
Yes, it's one thing to lead a coalition where the National Party leader gets to speak their mind and the Prime Minister does whatever they uh, want to do, but it's no good if that coalition ends up in opposition. And I have to, I have to say from previous experience, there was a lot more of a collegiate discussion about ministerial positions in the time of uh, Tony Abbott and Warren Truss. I saw that obviously uh, very closely. Less so in opposition under Malcolm Turnbull and yes when Brendan Nelson was there. So I'm surprised particularly because McCormack was weakened that the Prime Minister didn't express a little bit more will but clearly he didn't. Uh, you had some interesting news today. I was listening intently this afternoon. Apparently this deal the Labor nomination of, uh, of Lou O'Brien was cooked up a number of days ago. Yes, it was, in the sense that uh, Labor identified once Kevin Hogan went to the Ministry last week that the Deputy Speaker job was coming up. It was uh, intent then on making some mischief and waiting to see if one of the Rebel Nationals would nominate or whether they would nominate their own person. There's also a bit of intrigue around this conversation on Monday morning that uh, Kieran Gilbert and I have identified between Tony Burke and Lou O'Brien. Tony Burke is said to be the architect of this plan to push Lou O'Brien. Now, Labor people are denying they specifically discussed an offer to become Deputy Speaker, but you'd have to have some scepticism about that. Also, a bit of chatter around the place, which I tend to believe that Barnaby Joyce would have spoken to at least one Labor MP about this. Anthony Albanese didn't deny today that Labor MPs might have spoken to Nationals MPs about this. I don't think uh, for this to happen there's any doubt that uh, there, there was cooperation across the chamber there, which must be disturbing to the Prime Minister. It's clear to me that Tony Burke and others were negotiating with them to put Lou O'Brien's name forward. Now, what's also been put to us was that uh, there were a number of speeches prepared for different nominees, whether it be um, Lou O'Brien, David Gillespie or any other number of Joyce supporters. But once the Courier-Mail reported on Monday that Lou O'Brien was seeking to leave the Nationals party room, there's no doubt that the plan would have solidified around Lou O'Brien. Of course, the convenient thing about Lou O'Brien leaving the Nationals party room, Peter, is that meant he wasn't bound by the National Party decision in that party room to nominate Damien Drum. So that looks more than coincidental to me as well. Now, it was made to appear as if Lou O'Brien left the chamber, was surprised, didn't realise he was nominated and came back in. But it looks like much more of a scheme than that. Oh, yeah, they should have given him an Oscar for the way he went out there and was like, what, me? I have to come back in? I didn't know anything about this. I'm just a, a copper who's come into Parliament. I think it's fabulous. I'm standing there. Look, we've seen it all. I have seen it all. Um, I want to move to another issue too because, I mean, Matt Canavan now outside the Cabinet, dumb move, uh, I have to say to the Coalition, but you've heard me on that before. He has really found his voice and a bit of humour and he's out there, you know, constantly now as the former Resources Minister with plenty of ammunition to fire. He had this to say on the doors this morning at Parliament House. Finally, I welcome people having different views. Some of my colleagues or, or others uh, want to have a different view. Uh, to mine. Uh, that's, their, that's their right and I respect that. Uh, I just hope they'd consider at the next election uh, coming up to Collinsville uh, with a convoy perhaps of cars and, and vehicles uh, and holding a rally there to protest against the, the coal-fired power station there, particularly if they live south of the border, down in Sydney, Melbourne, maybe Tasmania. Please come up to North Queensland and tell us all how we're immoral and corrupt. It would help us a lot. I can't get the image out of my head of uh of, uh, you know, Trent Zimmerman or others in a WB ute, Andrew, headed all the way up north. Uh, you know, maybe Tim Wilson and others standing on the back of the ute with their big Go Coal stickers, or in this case, anti-coal stickers. It would go down incredibly well, I reckon, up there. Well, and it's a play on the Bob Brown convoy and how disastrous that was for Labor during the election campaign, isn't it? But this goes to my point again, Peter, about chaos theory continuing and uh, no sign in a let up in the campaign against Michael McCormack because Matt Canavan also was in the party room uh, talking about coal trying to fire up those moderate libs or you call them Turnbull style libs and uh, they didn't uh, res respond to that. They didn't respond to that because Matthias Cormann and Simon Birmingham, the cabinet ministers, had hit the phone, phones, presumably on the request of the Prime Minister to ask them not to respond as they did in the party room last week. So there was clearly a view from the Liberals, no more infighting stories, we've got to shut this down 
but Canavan's still out there pushing, pushing, pushing. And this is where your theory before about another spill, a potential compromise candidate in David Littleproud, or even a few months down the track, Michael McCormack being tapped on the shoulder. It, it, it's possible. Look, I'm not I'm saying it's going to happen, but certainly people around here are, are speculating on it. Why wouldn't well, you, given uh, the disruption? Well, There's just massive I disruption in the government at the moment. I've been saying for days now, probably about two and a half weeks, there is no way Michael McCormack, as decent as he is, as much of a good bloke as he is, will lead the National Party at the next election, right? Cut that grab out. Hit me with it on election night if I'm wrong, but he will not be leader. Anyway, got to leave it there. Andrew Cornell, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.